Man, these prices for cloud storage are crazy. There's gotta be a better way. Yo, what's up? Yo, she. So my cloud storage is filling up, but I don't wanna keep paying these high prices. Is there anything else I can do? Well, you could get a NAS. What's a NAS? NAS stands for Network Attached Storage, but let me break it down for you further and show you some best use cases so you can decide if you want one. So you can think of a NAS as basically a mini computer with a bunch of storage that's connected to the internet and it's meant to be always online so you can access it at any time. And this right here is my NAS, specifically it's the Synology 923 Plus and it has four hard drive bays in it and I took it offline just so I could show you what it looks like up close. So I usually have it sitting on top of this drawer unit as you can see back here. The only two cables that are connected slash needed are the AC power adapter and the ethernet cable because the NAS is always online, like I said before. I bought this NAS myself, but the hard drives were actually gifted to me by Western Digital, but more on that later. Synology is one of the leading companies when it comes to making NASes, but there's also QNAP and even Ugreen has started to make their own NASes. And some people who are way cooler than me are even able to make their own NASes. There are so many different types and sizes when it comes to a NAS, but one of the main differentiators that you need to know about is how many drives or bays does it support. The more bays means the more hard drives that you can actually put into it. My NAS right here is a four bay NAS, for example, and I have four of these 12 terabyte hard drives in it. Now you might think that since 12 times four equals 48, that this would mean that I have 48 terabytes of storage, right? Well, that's not actually the case. It's only about 30 terabytes, and it's because the way my NAS is currently configured, some of the storage space is used to protect against drive failures, which is how most NASs are set up today, honestly. Hard drives are not perfect tech by any means. They don't last forever, they will eventually fail, and sometimes they may fail earlier than you expect. But by configuring the NAS in this way, even when a drive fails, all you need to do is replace that failed drive with a new one and you still have all of your data. So essentially, you're trading space for durability and longevity, which is honestly always worth it. Now let's talk about these drives a little bit because you just can't put any old regular hard drive into a NAS and expect it to work. You're going to need drives specifically made for NASes and these are much more durable and pretty much made to be running constantly when compared to typical desktop drives. I know recently Synology made a change for their newer 2025 NASes and made them only officially compatible with other Synology branded hard drives, which is honestly really a bummer. But I bought this 923 Plus way before this change was announced, and older NASes like this don't have the same restriction for third-party hard drives. Anyways, NAS drives typically last between 3 and 5 years, which also lines up with their warranty usually. And like I stated before, I was gifted these Western Digital Red Pro drives, but it was actually the same drives that I would buy myself after I did my own initial research on what were some of the best drives to use in a NAS. These drives are built specifically for NASes. They have been rigorously tested in scenarios where multiple users are reading and writing data to them 24 seven. They're built to absorb shock and to protect against vibrations, which is very common in NASes with a lot of drive bays because there's just a lot of movement and spinning disks all bundled close together in there. And the read and write speeds for these drives are pretty good. When I was using the benchmark tool in the Synology NAS itself, I get around speeds of 240 megabytes per second to 250 megabytes per second. Now I'm gonna be honest with y'all, NAS drives are not cheap by any means, and depending on how much storage you need, you could be spending more than what the NAS cost itself. For example, to build a NAS like mine, it would cost around $1,700, which is very expensive, and the drives alone are worth over $1,000. There are definitely some cheaper options though, and it's all going to depend on how much storage you need and what type of NAS that you need. I've seen some DIY setups where people are able to save a ton of money by pretty much building their own NAS. But the benefit now is that I have a lot more storage than I would if I went with some other cloud storage options. I think Google Drive has an option up to 30 terabytes, but this is a lot more flexible and is cheaper in the long run. Just to give a quick cost comparison, if I were subscribed to the Google One program for 30 terabytes of data at $150 a month, it would take only 11 or 12 months to reach the price that I paid to build my NAS, and my NAS should last me a few years at least before any drive fails. Okay, so enough about talking about the NAS. Let me actually show you what it looks like to use and access files on one using your computer or on any other device. So most NASs that you buy actually come with their own software as well. Software that does everything from managing and monitoring your NAS to actually connecting to it and uploading files for it. 
Synology, for example, has DSM or Disk Station Manager, and after connecting your NAS to the network, you can use their Quick Connect website to log into DSM and manage everything about your NAS. So if I type Quick Connect into my browser here, you can see that this login page comes up. It has the name of my NAS, and it asks me to put a username and password in and do some two-step verification, and that's it. Here is where I can view the health of the NAS, manage files on it, and change any permissions or settings that I need to. And if we click on the file station icon here, you can see that these are all the folders that I have on my NAS. I have my raw videos, which I save all of my raw content videos. And then I have edited videos, which is just another folder for all of my fully edited YouTube or TikTok or Instagram videos. But this isn't the only way to access files on the NAS. And actually after setting it up initially, I rarely upload files this way anyway. Another way to connect to your NAS is by mapping it as a network drive on your computer. Once you map it as a network drive, it'll show up in your file explorer like all of your other local hard drives do. And as you can see here, I've already mapped my NAS onto my Windows PC, if I double click it, you can see that we see the same exact folders that we saw using Disk Station Manager. Here I can copy, delete, move around files as I need to, just like I do with all of the other folders on my computer. Now the transfer speeds are going to be much slower than copying files directly on your PC, especially if you have an SSD, since you're transferring over your local network. But you may be surprised on how fast that actually is. Your exact speeds are going to depend on several factors. The read and write speeds of your NAS drives, your configuration, the ethernet port on the back of the NAS, like whether you have one gigabit or two and a half gigabits or 10 gigabits, and everything else in between your NAS and the computer or device that's accessing those files. I made a video previously on how to optimize your network for gaming, and a good chunk of that will actually apply to NASes too if you wanna go and check it out. But anyways, yeah, these are just two of the many ways you can access and manage your NAS. Now let's get into some of the use cases, starting from the everyday use cases for regular folks, all the way up to use cases for heavily experienced folks so you can decide if getting a NAS is right for you and if it will be helpful for you in general. So one of the obvious use cases for a NAS is file storage, right? You have a bunch of files taking up a lot of space on your computer and you wanna store them in a place and have access to them wherever you are in the world. This could be family photos, important documents, maybe some old games that you've downloaded, anything. Some people also use a NAS as a way to back up their data. Like let's say you have a ton of work and files on your main laptop that you use actively and you're worried about losing all of your data if something ever happened to it. To solve this, you could schedule a routine on your laptop or computer that backs up all of your data, files, and folders to the NAS so that you have multiple copies of your stuff. And if anything were ever to happen to your computer or laptop, you would still have some or all of your data. This is actually a good time to mention, you should not use a NAS as your only backup solution. Yes, it does have some redundancy and fault tolerance, but if you have very important data and everything was stored solely on your NAS with no other copies anywhere, if something ever happened to your NAS or your house or your apartment, then everything's just gone. So when you have really important data, you should always use the 321 backup rule, which is have at least three copies of your data, Two of those copies should be on different types of storage mediums, like a hard drive or an SSD, and at least one of those copies in a different site, like in a different home, in a different country, cloud storage, whatever you need. This will help protect your data in case of natural disasters. And last but not least, one of my favorite everyday use cases for a NAS is actually using it as a media server. I don't have mine set up as a media server right now, but I think I might get a second NAS to do that in the future because it's just really cool. Some NASes are powerful enough to not only store a bunch of files, but they can also encode and decode video files quickly enough, which allows you to stream them directly over your local network or even when you're away from home. Lots of people use an application called Plex to achieve this and it basically turns whatever you want into a media server and then it pretty much becomes your own streaming service. Moving on to some power user use cases, these are still pretty common, but usually for folks who are a bit more tech savvy. With the right setup, you can also turn your NAS or several NASes into a content creation kind of workbench. If your network is fast enough, you can store all of your video editing projects and even raw videos on the NAS itself so that you can edit them from anywhere and even edit the same project with a team of video editors. Currently, I only use my NAS to store raw footage and B-roll so that I can go back and grab clips whenever I'm referencing them in a new video, but I can see myself editing off the NAS in the future. Now that's gonna take a lot more setup because currently my network isn't built for that, but Hey, we'll see in the future. Another common power use case is using your NAS for virtualization. As we talked about before, a NAS is basically a mini computer and some people use it to run apps directly on the NAS, 
With virtualization, you can do things like hosting a website, running a game server, or even setting up your own personal VPN, depending on how powerful your NAS is. Lastly, some use cases that I see mainly businesses do with NASes are collaboration and surveillance. Since the files on a NAS can be accessed from anywhere, it's a good way to set up collaborative work within a team. They can edit the same documents, share files easily, and work more efficiently. So that's why a lot of businesses tend to use something like this. For surveillance, NASes are also perfect machines for security cameras to store their footage. And even better, the videos are immediately accessible. Lots of security cameras actually can integrate with NASes pretty quickly and easily. So so, is a NAS right for you? Well, you should definitely first consider the cost and what you plan to use it for. Estimate how much storage you think you'll need. Here's a quick hint, you should always give a generous overestimate and then see how much it would cost for other solutions. If you've decided it's time to get one, then great. Just make sure you get a NAS with enough drive bays because you can't really change that afterwards. But there are some NASs out there that allow you to connect them together so that you can turn maybe a four bay NAS into an eight bay NAS, for example. Anyways, I hope this video was helpful. If there's a topic or detail that you'd like to learn more about, make sure to leave it in the comments and I'll see you next time.